of all, I'm Miss Armstrong, I'm a geography teacher here. I've just been in Dover College since September, so I'm fairly new to, to Dover College and, and indeed to England. So I previously worked in Ireland and before that I was in New Zealand, spent a bit of time in France, also in Turkey. So um, I've been around the world quite a bit. I've also worked in, in and outside the classroom and one of my passions is actually bringing people outside the classroom and, and actually um, showing them what we talk about in the classroom and um, that's one of the reasons why Discover the World Education was very appealing to me um, because um, not only this company takes people places but they actually do things as well and because I'm looking after outdoor education here and I'm running sailing programs I thought the more action the better I don't want to just go to Iceland and and look at things. I want to go to Iceland and do things and be part of it. I'm, I'm the same with all the students, um, and I love I love yeah activities as well and doing things with people. So that's when I um, yeah called upon Karen Corfield, and um, we're very much thinking along the same lines. So um, Karen is uh, going to tell you all about um, the trip to Iceland, which is taking place next June. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming along, and also um, just for your information, Jack. Uh, is going to be the other teacher on the trip as well and um, and if we get more people then we might need to call upon more teachers as well so um, yeah, thank you to Mr Payne for coming along and volunteering his time okay so I will hand over now to Karen and Karen will tell you a little bit about herself and then all about this trip to Iceland so thank you very much Karen thank you um, so as Ms Armstrong says my name is Karen I work for Discover the World Education prior to working to this company I was a geography, I suppose I am still a geography teacher technically, um, for 25 years, I know, I don't really look old enough, but I obviously am, and I was a pastoral deputy for 12 years as well. I then decided that I needed to get some hours back in my life, really, rather than being at work all the time, um, so trained to be an Icelandic guide, um, so I lived in Iceland for a couple of years, trained to be one of their guides. And then Discover the World Education found me and said, can you come and write some of our itineraries, um, help us develop the itineraries to make them very educationally valuable. Um, so that's kind of what I do now. Um, I also run all the professional training events that we do for schools and teachers across the country um, as well. So we're not just a travel company, we're also quite a good educational service as well. Um, so, as we were saying, we've been working closely together on making quite a bespoke programme for Dover College. We um, pride ourselves on every school trip being very, very different because every school is completely different. So, other companies might have an itinerary and they say, right, that's the itinerary you're doing. We don't do that. We start from scratch. We say, what do you want? And then we build the itinerary around it. Okay. So, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at... I've just gone away from the camera, which is a real pain. We're going to look a little bit about Iceland, look at your bespoke itinerary, some travel tips about Iceland because it is quite a different country compared to the UK and then because of the um, economic market that we're currently in I think it's very very important that you know a little bit about Discover the World because obviously you are entrusting us to take your children abroad, overseas, so you need to know a little bit about where we're coming from in terms of health and safety, and also in terms of how your money is protected as well. I haven't got a clicker, so I'm really sorry. I'm gonna go backwards and forwards just a little bit. So first of all then, Iceland is a country in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it is the only place on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where the land comes out of the ocean. Okay. So in geography, one of the key things in tectonics and stuff like that is all to do about the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and Iceland is the only place where you can actually see it. Okay. It sits around about 40, sorry, 66 degrees north and the top part of Iceland is about 44 kilometres south of the Arctic Circle. So it's not quite in the Arctic Circle but it's as close as you're going to get to be honest. Reykjavik, being its capital, is the northernmost capital in the world. Because it sits in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, it can sometimes have slightly erratic weather. Um, obviously, it is surrounded by the sea. It does have winds that come up from Antarctica. So we're talking about quite sort of like big winds and strong winds which come across the sea. You can see that when you're going to Iceland, the average temperature is around about 10 degrees. But there may be some days when it's 2 degrees, and there may be some days when it's 18, 19 degrees, okay? So it really does depend. When you go, you will be on a slightly different time difference because they don't change their clocks like we do. 
they sit always at GMT, so it will be slightly, um, slightly different in terms of the hour. It takes around about two and a half hours to fly there. Sometimes it takes three, and sometimes it takes two hours, ten minutes. Depends on the wind direction and whether or not you've got a tailwind or a headwind. Okay. The Icelandic krona is the currency. We will look at the money as we go through. So, here is Iceland in terms of its location. And it is a land that is created by volcanoes. I'm going to flick through these really, really quickly. Moulded by glaciers and rivers. Obviously has the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Beautiful waterfalls. Fantastic geysers, 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 whichever way you want to say it. Lovely glaciers, glaciers. Now, glaciation isn't something that we particularly do in the specs anymore. Um, the government took it out. You do a little bit about glaciation in the UK. And then when you go on to do A-level, you study it a little bit. But we do still study glaciation in terms of climate change. And obviously the big topic in schools and in the news and on social media and everywhere you go because of the Friday strikes now is all about climate change. And this particular glacier here is retreating at around about 60 to 100 metres a year. Um, so it is quite massive and quite dramatic and that's one of the reasons why we go to this particular location because it sparks the conversation because you can actually see the evidence of climate change there. Okay. The curriculum links, it covers, I would say, 90% of the geography spec, okay? Not only that, it also covers around about 40% of your science um, specifications, and if you're doing photography or art, it can also be a stimulus for that as well. So it really covers lots of different aspects. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I'm also going to add to this the concept of globalisation, sustainability, responsible travel, conservation, stewardship, all of those new type geography elements that we're now starting to introduce into the classroom and actually are becoming a little bit more apparent. Okay, so this is where you are going to go in five days. All right, quite a lot of the island just in those five days. You're going to fly into Keflavik, which is here. You don't fly into Reykjavik, even though some people think you do. You don't, you fly into Keflavik. There's only one road in Iceland, as you can see, really one main road, road one. Okay. You will travel on road one all the way around to Jokulsalen, which is where they film a lot of the Bond and Fast and Furious films. Okay. And then you will head all the way back round. You can see a very famous volcano here, Eyjafjallajökull, which is the volcano that erupted in 2010. Didn't do an awful lot of damage in Iceland, to be honest, but created chaos everywhere else in the world. Um, and you're going to see some of the highlights of Iceland, the touristy bit on one day of Finnbetlia, Golfos and Geysa. Okay, so they're your kind of highlights. You'll notice also on here the Blue Lagoon. Um, we don't actually take you to the Blue Lagoon, it's very, very touristy, really touristy, full of cruise ship people, costs an awful lot of money um, and they also have an age limit and a staff to pupil limit now, so they've made it quite a high class spa experience rather than the Icelandic experience. But don't worry, we'll get you swimming in the geothermal pools, it's no worries at all. Okay, so on day one, you will fly Gatwick, um, from Gatwick to Keflavik with either Iceland Air or EasyJet. They're the only two airlines that go out there on a regular basis now in any case. Um, the collapse of WOW didn't help us. They were an Icelandic airline who are no longer flying. Um, British Airways only fly out twice a week, so pretty erratic really. So you'll either go um, Iceland Air or EasyJet, we don't know yet. You'll meet your guide, these are two of my colleagues who I trained, lovely Roger there on the left and um, Roger and Richard on this side, um, and you'll meet a, a guide and it will either be an Icelandic guide or it will be someone like myself, who's um, a British person who has trained to guide in Iceland and has been a teacher before. So you'll have one or the other. And I'll um, liaise with Miss Armstrong as to which is the best for your school. So we're going to drive across the Rakens Peninsula first of all. This is an area of UNESCO importance. And the reason why it is, is it's one of the only places in the world where it has sort of like this unique tectonic and geological formations absolutely full of lava fields, 
This particular area has got lots of fumaroles, geothermal energy. You can see there's lots of um, iron in the rocks here. It smells like rotten eggs. And on a cold day, it will be steaming and bubbling. And it's a really good introduction to Iceland. The Rakens Peninsula is where Neil Armstrong and the um, crew of the space program in the 1960s did their training. Okay, so they spent six months in Iceland because um, they considered that the Rakens Peninsula was the nearest thing to the surface of the moon that they were going to get. Okay, apart from the fact that there's a bit of gravity in Iceland. And and that sort of stuff, but the actual rocks and the terrain they actually considered was very, very similar. So they spent around about um, six months in Iceland. The second place that you'll go is the bridge between the continents, which is sort of like the edge of the plate. And you can see there the different layers. The layers depict the volcanic eruptions, the lava fields over the years. So it's like a chronological display of the different lava that has gone down. And you'll be able to jump down into the fissures, you can walk into some extinct craters. And here, the plates are actually moving apart. So at this particular point, they move apart around about two centimetres every year. So this particular bridge is on sort of like wheels, it's on a wheel system. So if they do get a sudden movement, um, then obviously the bridge isn't going, to, isn't going to collapse. It's been there as long as I can remember, so I don't think it's going <coughs> anywhere soon. Um, it's a really good place to sort of like see the land and to see how Iceland is made. From there, you're going to go to these particular cramp, um, stamper craters. You can climb into these craters. They haven't erupted for about 3,000 years, um, but they're actually quite a cool thing to do, to actually go into the crater and see where the lava would have come out. And then you will go to another fumarole, smelly place, um, which really it's sort of like the colours here in June will just be spectacular it will look something like that um, and you can see the silica and the sulphur you see the yellow this is the sulphur and then you've got the white which is the silica and then you've got the red which is all the iron okay from there you're going to go to one of my favorite places which is the lava tunnel okay so you will get a hard hat which has got a light um, and you will go down into the lava tunnel. Um, this lava tunnel is one of the largest in um, Iceland and you don't have to go on your hands and knees or anything like that. It's massive, it's as big as this room to be honest in terms of its um, height and width um, and you'll be able to walk around about a kilometre into this lava tube. You'll be able to see all the different formations that lava makes within the tubes all the different sort of like stalactites and stalagmites which are from the lava drops you'll be able to see the chocolate wall I'm not going to tell you what that is until you actually get down there um, but as you can see the colors here are not fake this is just a white light on the colors actually in the lava tube all right so quite an experience and it's cold down there really cold because obviously you're sitting at around about 300 meters under the ground um, so a really, really good introduction. From there you're going to go horse riding and you will take an Icelandic horse which is unique um, because it does have an extra gait um, which means it doesn't just trot and canter um, and gallop, it has two extra gaits as well. Very, very easy to ride. If I say to you that my daughter had never ridden a horse before and then two years ago, a friend of mine's got an Icelandic horse on. So two years ago, I said to her, we are going to go Icelandic horse riding across the lava fields. And she went, but mummy, I've never been on a horse before. Well, you'd be fine. And she rode bareback for around about three hours um, on a horse and was absolutely fine. Because if you look at them, they've got a very broad back. Okay, so it's a bit like sitting in a chair. And because they've got the extra gait, they don't go like that. They go like that. Okay, very, very easy to ride, and what a way to see the country on their sort of like their special, unique animal. There are no ice, other horses in Iceland apart from the Icelandic horse, it is a unique breed. They're not allowed to have other horses go in, and if you take that horse there out of the country, it's not allowed to go back into Iceland. Okay, so it really is quite a special breed of horse. Um, it'll be lovely, you're having a whale of a time on there. They give you a saddle, by the way, just so just that you know. 
And then, um, very close to your accommodation, there is an outdoor swimming pool. Um, you can actually walk to it, which is fantastic. I've decided to picture it in snow, just so you can see what it could look like. Um, but you can see it's a geothermally heated swimming pool, which sits at around about sort of like 36, 37 degrees centigrade, so kind of like a warm bath. Costs about 80p to go in. They like you to swim, so you don't really have to pay very much for it. Um, there's slides here, there's hot tubs, there's just, you know, and it's in the middle of a lava field. So again, a fantastic Icelandic experience. This is what the Icelandic people do. They don't go to the Blue Lagoon. They call the Blue Lagoon the dirtiest swimming pool in Iceland. Okay. And to be honest, it is because nobody showers before you go in there and you're meant to. And it's not very nice, really. Whereas at the swimming pool, you shower before you go into the swimming pool. You have a lovely time and that's what the Icelandic people do. Okay. That's my recommendation in any case. And then you're going to go to my second home, as I call it, Guest House Hargeable. Helga runs this house. It was in her family for the last 300 years. She's converted it from a farm into a guest house. Um, so therefore you have this sort of like sort of courtyard with lots of different separate buildings where you will be. Lots of fields where you can play football or take a frisbee or they've got like a big decking area outside with lots of chairs. And they also have three hot tubs which you are allowed to use. And if you are an animal lover, she also has several dogs um, who live on the farm as well. Three generations of dogs that she has on the farm. So really, really lovely place. She'll treat you as if you're her children. Um, I always seem to put on half a stone when I go there. Then from there, you're going to drive through the valley which was affected by the Eoflecka Yerkel um, eruption. This was really the major damage that happened here. When the eruption happened, the glacier melted. So it wasn't so much the lava and the ash that caused the problem, it was actually the glacier melting and sort of like creating this flat area here. You will drive through there, first of all, and then you will head to Selyanfoss waterfall. This waterfall you are able to walk behind in the undercut, so you'll be able to stand behind the waterfall. And when you look up, you'll be able to see fossils and all the different shells and fish and all of that sort of stuff in this sea, because they used to be sea cliffs, all right? But because of isostatic rebound, the land is lifting up. This used to be by the sea, but it's not anymore. Um, and you'll be able to see evidence of that as well. You will get wet. Okay, there's no doubt about it. I would encourage you to get wet because then you'll dry. Okay, if you've got a waterproof jacket or trousers, even better because then you're going to keep dry underneath. Um, but yeah, you, you will get wet and that's good. From there, you're going to walk along to the canyon dweller. You have to walk through a river to get to this particular waterfall. When you get to it and you get inside a particular waterfall, you go and stand on that rock and you look up and it's like the waterfall is coming down from a skylight above your head. I think this is my favourite waterfall. It's pretty stunning. From there, you're going to, if you're ever a Justin Bieber fan, you will have seen this waterfall because it's featured in one of his videos. He got fined for doing that video, just that so you know, because he walked on the moss. You're not allowed to walk on the moss. Okay, it's protected. Um, anyway, he did this video and decided to swim in this particular river. Why you do that, I don't know, because it's glacial and it's really, really cold. Um, I suggest you get as close as you possibly can to that waterfall, okay? Um, because the power of this waterfall is just incredible. There are 569 steps up the right-hand side, so you'll have the opportunity to walk up that set, those steps, keep going, and then actually if you continue along that waterfall, you come to the next waterfall. If you continue another five minutes, you come to the next waterfall, and you'll be the only ones there. Here you'll have lots of people, <coughs> But climb up the steps, just keep going, okay? There's 26 waterfalls in the Cascades. All right, just do three. You haven't got time to do any more. <laughs> so, from there, you're going to go to the glacier. And you will take a guided walk on the glacier. So, you'll be given a harness. You will be given crampons. You'll be given a hard hat. You'll be given an ice pick axe thing. And our lovely glacier guides will take you up onto the glacier. You'll walk about two kilometres up there. Um, and it's just the most incredible experience because you feel as if you're in the middle of nowhere, first of all, because there's hardly anybody up there. Um, it is quite a challenge walking up 
but your glacier guys are absolutely brilliant and no matter what your level of fitness is or your ability everybody can get up that particular glacier now i can see some parents looking at me saying harness okay 12 16 year olds on a harness mm -hmm. one goes they all go you're not strapped onto each other the only reason why you have a harness is because if you fell okay it means that they can hook you back up all right so you're not strapped to each other we haven't got an Everest <coughs> going on all right but you'll learn about the glacier learn about the eruptions that's the most important thing and also about climate change while you are up there and your ice axe is not for hitting the ice it's for using like a walking stick it's really quite clever so that's uh, that's something you will learn when you're up there from there, you're going to go to the Icelandic Lava Show, and this is a very good friend of ours, Julius, who um, basically said, why can I not produce lava? Okay, He'd seen lava, because he lives in Iceland, and he lives in the middle of, sort of like a volcanic area, and he wanted everybody to be able to experience lava in a safe environment, Okay, because we would never take you to go and see lava, because... You know, real lava is hot and dangerous and stuff like that. So what he has done is he has um, produced this show, as I say a show, this exhibition, where he has produced lava. It is real lava, but obviously it's manufactured by him. And he brings it into the room in a safe environment. So it's a little bit like this room here, but you're in a circle, and the lava flows down the middle of the room. Um, and he shows you how lava moves and how it reacts when it hits ice, more importantly, and then when it cools down, what happens to it. And then he also talks about the Katla eruption that will happen at some point in the future and what he, as a resident of this town in South Iceland, has to do should that happen. Okay. So in terms of your planning, precautions, protection, uh, which we have to um, learn quite a lot about in geography, that is the most fantastic case study. Uh, and it's hot, okay? When you go to this show, just remember, she said it was going to be hot, okay? So please make sure you've got a t-shirt on under all your different layers because it is really, really hot, okay? Okay. From there, you're going to go to the Black Sand Beach, to Rainish Furphy. You can see the stacks. You'll also from there be able to see some arches, some stumps, some caves, some cracks. You've also got the basalt columns here. Um, and you may, if you are lucky, because of the time of year that you are going, as you are walking along the beach, not too close to the sea please, but as you're walking along the beach, I'm sure that you will get to see seals and you may even get to see the whales because they love coming down into this area during the summer months. Um, the last four summers that I've guided there, I've seen whales off the beach at Rainish Furphy. Um, so keep your eye out for them because you will see them. Um, and puffins. Puffins will be there as well. Then you're going to go back to um, your second accommodation. So these are the Aarhus cottages. So you will be given your own cottage between sort of like four of you. Um, it's in the middle of, as you can see, sort of like a forested area. There's a fantastic salmon river that you can take a walk up there. There's a swimming pool within 300 metres of the cottages. Um, and it really is a truly Icelandic experience. The town of Hella has only got 600 people living it in any case. Um, so it's a really, really small village, Hamlet, same size as your school. Um, you know, so it really is a beautiful, beautiful location. Hotel Hella also has a great restaurant um, where they will serve you sort of like a buffet style evening meal and then breakfast will be a buffet style as well. I'll talk about foods when I get to foods because I know that's really important. Okay. So day three, we're now a little bit tired. So we're going to see the Stack Stump Arch at Duralay and this is where you can watch the puffins coming in and out of the cliffs. And from there, we will head to Eldrin, which is the lava field. So this particular eruption happens in 1783, and the moss is starting to grow on this particular area. It's not really a stop where you can walk around, because you're not allowed to walk on the moss, because it is protected. 
um, but it is quite a spectacular scenery to see this one lava field in amongst all the other lava fields and in amongst the, um, the glaciers and the rivers. So that's the reason why you will go there. From there, you will head to the Feather Canyon, another Justin Bieber moment. Um, and as you can see, steep-sided gorge, glaciated gorge, uh, where you will see hanging valleys, um, lots of mini waterfalls along here. You'll get the chance to walk through this river um, up to sort of like other waterfalls where you'll be able to climb them. Um, it's one of my favourite places in Iceland because not many people go there. Um, so it is quite off the beaten track as such. Okay. From there, you'll go to Skaftafell National Park where we will start to study the glaciers before going on to Jokulsalem, which is where they make the Bond films and the Fast and Furious films and that sort of stuff. And whilst you are at Jokulsalem, which is a glacial lagoon, you will take like what's like a duck boat. So it's a bit like a car and then it goes into the glacial lagoon. And then you're going to actually take this boat around all the different icebergs that are sitting in the glacial lagoon. Um, it is sort of quite, an, like it says, an unforgettable experience. If you're really, really quiet on the boat, you can actually hear the ice creaking and cracking underneath you. So make sure that you do sort of like stay quiet on that boat to actually hear that experience as well. And then from there, you're going to head to the Diamond Beach. So it is a black beach, but the icebergs sit on the beach a bit like great big diamonds. And you'll have the opportunity to go quite close to them, to sit on them, to stand on them. It's a great Instagram moment, I have to say. Um, just try and do something different than what other people do on Instagram. So if you sort of like are, are following somebody who does have Icelandic pictures and you see their Instagram photo of the Diamond Beach, do something a little bit different because actually I'm fed up with seeing the same ones. All right. And hashtag us in because we, we redo them all and everything. And then you're going to go to the Dwarf Cliffs. Um, these basalt columns, you'll learn about these, but basically it's when lava meets seawater or magma rises up and meets the seawater, and then the chemical reaction puts it into these hexagonal shapes, um, and you'll be able to climb all over these, which is great. We like a bit of climbing. Safe climbing. Okay, and then you're going to go back to um, Aarhus Cottages. It's quite nice having two nights in the same accommodation, because as a teacher, otherwise you spend sort of like a good hour in the morning picking up socks, um, and picking up towels and saying whose is this and charges that seems to be my favourite thing at the moment to bring home from Iceland um, so it's quite nice having two nights in the same accommodation because it means you don't have to pack every single night okay day four you're going to do what I call our popular day this is what most people do when they go to Iceland so first of all you'll go to Goldfoss the golden waterfalls massive waterfall and can you see where my arrow is here that's people okay so you'll be able to walk down the side of the gorge, it goes off the screen, sorry, and you'll be able to stand here. It's fantastic, because you can't hear the person next to you speak, which is great because of the power. Um, and yeah, actually feeling the power of that waterfall is quite cool. Then you will go to the geyser, geyser, geyser. You will learn about how these erupt, why the geyser no longer erupts, and why Strucker does, okay? Um, and there's some fantastic walks that you can take above the area um, where nobody else goes because they're not fit enough generally. Um, so get right the way up to the top and then sit, have your lunch, because I planned it that way, overlooking this particular area um, and just seeing this erupt. Now, a bit of advice. If you've got a technological device, i.e. a phone, that you take pictures with, okay, you'll stand there. This erupts every 6 to 12 minutes. But because it's nature, it's not as if someone's pressing a button and it's going to go every six minutes. It doesn't work like that, okay? So you're standing there and you're chatting and you're chatting and then someone comes up to you, taps you on the shoulder, you turn around and you've missed it and it's gone, okay? My recommendation is buy a postcard here, okay? Put the, put the camera, I think cameras are great, don't get me wrong, they're really, really great. But at this particular point, okay, um, just go and buy a postcard or something like that um, or video it, um, do it on slow-mo or time-lapse or something like that and that's a much better option for you. You will get to see it erupt maybe seven, eight times while you're there because you'll spend a good hour there and it will go. It's guaranteed that one. Then you're going to go to Thingvetnir National Park 
Um, and I know Miss Armstrong is particularly excited about this day <laughs> um, because one of the things that we're hoping that you'll be able to do, because there is an age limit on this, so one of the things that we ha are hoping that you are able to do is to actually snorkel between the plates, between the fissures in Thin Vecnia National Park. This is probably my favouritest area in Iceland and the reason why that is is because it is pure geography here, so therefore I do become a bit of a geography geek here. Um, you can see the layers in the rock where all the volcanic eruptions have happened. In the distance you can see the shield volcano that actually caused this rift valley. In addition to that you have got loads of fissures, craters, you've got lakes, you've got the American plate over there, you've got the Eurasian plate here, um, you've got waterfalls going on. And then, not because we're really interested in this, and so I apologise for anybody who is studying one of the other humanities subjects, but you do learn a little bit about history because this is considered to be um, where the first democratic parliament ever in the world happened in 930 AD. You will learn a little bit about the punishment system as to what happened to women um, if they committed adultery, um, what happened to the men if they stole something. Um, so it really is a place where you can spend hours and hours and hours and hours just learning about the whole Icelandic experience. Um, obviously we're focusing a little bit on the snorkelling here because that really is quite a big wow factor. But if you don't do the snorkelling, I, you know, it is still the most amazing place to go because there's so many different things that you can do there. Okay, from there, you're probably going to have a sleep on the coach, I would suspect. It takes you around about an hour to get back to Reykjavik city centre. This is one of the fastest growing um, economic and financial centres in the world. If you think about strategically and politically where it is in the world, in between Europe and America, okay, in between Russia and America, um, you really have got a sense of maybe <coughs> why it is growing so fast. This was also the place where Gorbachev and Reagan did a very famous handshake to end, supposedly, the Cold War, okay? And you will visit that house and you can replicate that handshake, should you wish. Um, but it is quite a famous house um, and it was meant to end spying. Um, not quite sure whether that actually happened. But Reykjavik really is a stunning city, but it is in quite a transitional zone at the moment, okay? Then you're going to stay in um, a functional hotel. It's a bit like a travel lodge, really. They do now have white duvets, not this horrible brown. Okay, but I couldn't find a picture that had white duvets. But it's all white duvets now and green walls and stuff, so it's quite funky now. But it's a little bit like a travel lodge. Um, the reason why we choose it is because it's right in the middle of the city centre. So it means within 10 minutes you can be in the city centre, and that's the most important thing. Within three minutes, you can be on Reykjavik Harbour Bay. Um, so you can actually get to the seafront within sort of like three minutes um, of being there. So really lovely hotel, actually. It's very clean. It's functional. It's all en suite. It's, you know, it's the hotel. So. Okay. Dinner that night will either be spent at the Hard Rock Cafe, which has only been in Reykjavik for the last two years, but you get a really nice meal and lots of loud music, which I'm sure you really like, but I want them to tone it down. And, or alternatively, you could go to um, the Icelandic hamburger factory. They don't just sell hamburgers, okay? They do other things as well. If you see the numbers at the back, the reason why um, I sort of tend to encourage schools to go here is one, because it's Icelandic and not American, because you can go to a hard rock cafe anywhere. Um, but the numbers at the back show the population of Iceland. This was taken a couple of years ago now. Um, and you can see there's a bell next door to the numbers. And when they <coughs> ring the bell, it's basically to depict when somebody's born. So they sort of like have a count up. It generally happens on a Saturday. I don't think everybody's born on a Saturday, but I think that's when most people are in the restaurant on a Saturday. So everybody gets really excited when somebody's born, um, and then that number's change. At the moment, it's sitting at around about 340,000 people for the whole country, okay? So if you think about, I don't know, what's the population of Dover? How many? Around 33,000. Okay. For the Dover. Yeah, okay. So if you think about quite a 
sort of like a big town. I know <coughs> Croydon, which is my biggest town, has got a larger population than Iceland. So you won't see many people. A traffic jam consists of about five cars. So, um, and the driver gets really irate when there's five cars. Yes, I'm so sorry about the traffic. <laughs> Just try living in London. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, the flights back to Gatwick come back in the morning, so that particular day you will just sort of like head back along the Mackenzie Peninsula, um, sort of like to um, the flight home from Keflavik back to London Gatwick. And no doubt you will probably sleep on the plane because you're going to be tired. Okay, so some travel tips, the food. Now, there is this myth that we are going to feed you puffin, rotten shark, horse, um, pickles, sheep's bits, all that sort of stuff. Yes, they do sell those. There's no doubt about it, they do. However, we have an agreement with our suppliers that they will give you something that you would recognise and also that teenagers will eat. So the chances are, while you are at the Aarhus Cottages, which is in Helen, you'll probably have a pizza buffet one night and probably some sort of pasta with um, sauce the next night. The reason for that is, I would say, six or seven years ago, our Icelandic suppliers weren't really sort of big on tourism, to be honest, and were handing out fish pie and all of that sort of stuff, and of course the kids didn't eat it. And then, of course, the complaints that we would get was that the kids were hungry. So we can't have hungry kids, so we make sure that for dinner and for lunch, there is something that you sort of like will eat. Lunch at both the hotels, you will make your own from the breakfast buffet. So you will be given, um, I suggest you take a sandwich box with you rather than using a plastic bag because I have a thing about plastic. So please take a sandwich box with you, okay? You will make your sandwiches and then you will put them in your sandwich box and that is your sandwiches for the day. Take a refillable water bottle or a flask with you and then obviously you've got a drink for the day as well. And then you will be given fruit and you'll be given biscuits. In bre at breakfast, you will have a selection of everything that you can possibly think of. So you've got cereal, you've got toast, you've got bread, you've got ham, you've got cheese, you've got skier, you've got fruit. So you basically have whatever you fancy for breakfast and you need to eat because you will get hungry during the day. I do recommend that you go to a supermarket and look at the stuff that you can also buy that's Icelandic. And maybe one evening, I suggest that you have a bit of a taster table, buy something you're not actually sure what it is, and then all put it out on the table and try it, okay? Because it is quite interesting. Um, I love the Icelandic chocolate. I love the skia, which is the half between the yogurt and fromage fry. It's a bit like a cheese, but not quite. Um, and I also love, they do like chocolate covered raisins, which are really, really good. So I recommend those as well. I don't recommend the dried fish unless you really, really love fish, because it's a bit like beef jerky, but fish. Okay? And as a non-fish eater, it's pretty vile. <laughs> Licorice is good. The language is hard. Really, really hard. Um, I tried for two years to learn Icelandic, and I can kind of understand what they're saying. I can never admit to that but I can understand what they're saying, but I still can't really speak it because they have different ways of pronouncing things and I'm a people person, I'm not a linguist at all. But try it, okay? You will be taught, no matter, what, no matter whether you've got a guide like myself or whether you've got an Icelandic guide, you will be taught some Icelandic, okay? So if you come home with 10 words, which is about what I've got, um, then you're doing really, really well. The most important one is golden iron, which means good day, and you can say that all day. It's fantastic, okay? And then tack, which is thank you, okay? And then you're doing really well. Okay, you know Icelandic as much as I do. The currency is the Icelandic krona. The banks do not stock this. You will need to order it, and you'll need to order it at least five working days in advance, okay? The post office, if you try and order it online through the post office, have a minimum order as well, okay? I don't know whether that would change with what's happening, God knows what's happening, but that might change. I will say to you, I have not used Icelandic currency for four years. I just tap a card, <coughs> okay? They are the most plastic-friendly country in the world. Okay, um, so if you are happy to take a currency card or a debit card with you that's got a limit, obviously, um, then that is probably the best thing to do. 
Um, I don't think there's anywhere that you're going that won't take um, a tapping card, okay? Um, but you don't need much money because kind of everything's included in any case and it's quite expensive out there, although our rate is getting a little bit better at the moment. This is the exciting bit. You will get 24 hours daylight. I think you might see the sun set slightly, but it will come back up again within about 20 minutes. Uh, you are four days, or I think two, no, because you're going to 22nd of June, so you are sort of near enough on the longest day. So, um, how amazing is that? So you will hopefully get to see the midnight sun, which um, not many people get to see the midnight sun. So, um, enjoy that. If you struggle sleeping in the sun, which most teenagers don't, but they say they do, because obviously they can't sleep, Okay, get an eye mask. Yeah, Primark sell them for about a pound. Okay, get an eye mask. Okay. So what to pack? You don't need specialist equipment at any level. But what you do need is sensible clothing. Jeans are a waste of time for during the day. Those jogging bottoms that are sort of like a fleecy thing that sort of when they get wet hang here. They're a waste of time because you will get wet, okay? And when those particular items get wet, they don't dry and then you're going to actually be miserable for most of the day. So make sure that you've got some sensible trousers as in sort of like walking type trousers or leggings or sort of like the decent tracksuit bottoms which are sort of like that wicky dry material. Absolutely perfect. And then just in case it's cold, or when you're on the glacier or the glacial lagoon, make sure you've got sort of like some thermal leggings or, or tops to go underneath. You then need sort of like a couple of t-shirts, a couple of fleeces, and then a waterproof. It is not going to be freezing, freezing cold when you go, okay? But obviously there are two days where you're going to be on a glacier, okay? So obviously it's ice, so it might be cold. So therefore we would recommend that you have a hat and that you have some gloves with you as well. The last time I was out there in the summer, I think I put my jacket on once in 11 days. So it was really quite warm, um, but we just don't know. You know, there has been a couple of times when I've been out there in the summer where it's rained every day. So, you know, you, you will definitely see some rain and you will definitely see some sun and then you'll see everything in between. So just make sure you've got your layers Obviously, you're going to shower every day, so it, you don't need five layers, okay, because you can wear the same t-shirt twice, you're allowed. Um, walking boots or shoes are essential because obviously you've got those crampons to go on the bottom of them and they can't fit them on <coughs> sort of vans or converse, they're no good. Nike Airs, pff, waste of time, okay, you need sturdy walking boots to put those crampons <coughs> on. Um, obviously, you need a rucksack, sunglasses, EU2 pin adapter. At the moment, we are recommending that you have an EHIT card. Iceland's not in Europe in any case, but they do recognise the EHIT card. Um, and you need to have at least six months on your passport. That is what the government is saying today. That might change on the 31st of January, I don't know. For those of you that don't have a European passport, you will need to check with your particular passport office as to whether or not you need a visa. But because you are going into a Schengen Group country, it will be very, very easy to get one. And because you are travelling with a UK school, it's also very, very easy to get one, okay? So um, you should be absolutely fine with that. Um, and then obviously your refillable water bottle. The water is drinkable from any tap anywhere in Iceland, okay? Do not buy bottled water, complete waste of money, because all they do is get the water and fill it up. Okay. So please do that. We really encourage you to be a responsible traveller, um, just literally because, sort of like in the current sort of like you know way the world is, um, we want you to travel because otherwise you wouldn't have the chance to experience these things. We know that travelling is controversial, so therefore we try and make sure that we are as sustainable and responsible as possible. To reassure you, if you are a climate striking person, like my daughters are, um, we offset all your carbon in any case, so we've already paid for that. We um, invest in the Land Trust, which doesn't plant trees, it protects land from being um, destroyed. So 
we believe that that is the best way, that's what we've been advised to do as the best way to carbon offset. But obviously we are using a bus and we are using a plane, but we, we do try as much as possible try and offset the impact of that. What we ask you to do is to be a responsible traveller by making sure that you keep yourself safe. Iceland isn't like the UK where you have got signs and fences everywhere saying when you've got a pool of water that there's, it's wet. You know, you've seen these signs where you've got sort of like a snow field and it says careful slippery. You don't have that in Iceland. If there's ice there, it's pretty common sense that it's going to be slippy. All right, so please just keep yourself safe. We want you to ask loads and loads and loads and loads of questions. That's why you're going, to ask questions. We want you to respect the Icelandic culture. They are different, okay? You'll get used to it. And they are really lovely once you get used to it. Um, and most importantly to me, please, please respect my country. All right, don't leave. You won't see litter anywhere. The only litter that you will see will have been left by a tourist, okay? But you won't also see bins, okay? Take the litter home with you. Your coach driver or whatever will, will take it off of you. Don't worry about that, all right? Please make sure that you stay on the footpaths. Do not be daft and go on sort of like protected areas. Um, I'd quite like my grandchildren to have somewhere um, to go in the future, okay? So, now, oh, you can win £100. Do you know, I did eight presentations before I even realised what that said, okay? It didn't win. It's not a particularly good photo. I'm sure it was fun putting it together, but... <laughs> Don't do that. Do a diamond beach photo, but not the same as everybody else. Yeah? Um, it's not a great photo, to be fair. Anyway, so the boring bit about us is um, we've been doing this for quite a long time now um, and we are STF. Now, your school would be um, inspected by ISI, a bit like Ofsted, they come in and make sure they're doing the best thing. Um, we get inspected as a tour operator as well and we're one of the only tour operators to have the highest level of STF rating, um, which basically means all our hotels, our coaches, our guides, everything that we possibly do has been audited and inspected to an inch of its life um, to make sure that everything that we do is safe. Obviously you are doing some quite sort of like adventurous activities and they have all been inspected and made sure that they are safe for not just adults but also for students as well. In terms of your money, it's completely protected by ABTA and ATOL. Um, and to me, as a parent, this is the most important one, which is our exclusive travel disruption charter. So our company was set up um, by um, Clive, who sits in the office next door to me. It's a family-run business. Clive used to live in Iceland for about seven or eight years, and he actually sits on the tourism board in Iceland as well because he was the first company to take tourists out to Iceland so therefore he's considered quite sort of like special in Iceland because he's kind of helped turn their economy round a little bit um, so he's quite well respected and because of that they've given us this exclusive travel disruption charter which basically means if a volcano goes off while you are out there we will guarantee that you will come home first. You may not come home immediately because obviously the flights might not be available, but if there is a group of um, adults um, out there and there's you, you will take priority and we will also guarantee that you will be sort of like put up in a hotel um, and looked after until we can get you home. That's something that's not generally covered by insurance because volcanic eruptions aren't. Um, but we sort of like have that special insurance there for you to make sure that it's at no expense to yourself. So you will be really, really looked after. Um, and just to say, if, if you haven't been to Iceland before, it's quite a special country. You will learn so much about um, the world and about culture and about how the world was sort of like, you know, made um, as such. And pastorally, as well as educationally, it really is a trip of a lifetime. And you, you'll come back slightly different, um, which I think is always just fantastic. So, because as a guide, I just want you to say wow every day um, and stop being a teenager and looking at your little boxes and actually go and get wet and go and get dirty and go and sort of like really experience the world and then hopefully travel lots when you're older as well. So, I will be here 
um, answering any sort of like individual questions. So if you've got a specific question about your child or about the experience, um, please do come and talk to me. Is there any sort of like generic questions that sort of like we can answer about the trip? I know Miss Armstrong's going to look at the cost and everything um, now, but is there any sort of generic questions for me about the trip as such? Allergies. I always get questions about allergies. We cover every allergy, nut-free, gluten-free. Not if you don't like kiwi fruit, just don't eat it. But if you are highly allergic to kiwi fruit or nuts, then obviously do let us know and we'll make sure that that's not um, put in your food. Um, and also if you're vegetarian or vegan, we will cover that as well. I will say Iceland has a very small population who kind of live off what they've got. Because if you imagine you've got this extreme sort of like country in the middle of nowhere. Um, so therefore the selection of gluten-free bread is not like Sainsbury's. There's like one non-gluten bread. It, it, it's a little bit like a brick. So if you are really gluten-free, not just that you don't like eating gluten, then take your own because it is slightly better than the Icelandic gluten-free option. Um, but yeah, vegan, vegetarian, all of that, that we can, we can cater for, no problem at all. Um, can I just say thank you so much, Karen? Um, extremely informative talk, and I think um, whether we go or not, um, I mean, in terms of, sorry, um, parents, but it's just for students. Um, <laughs> I just think that was very, very in inter inter interesting and informative. So can I just say thank you to Karen, and thank you all for coming along tonight. Okay.